Hello. Hello. Who is that? Operator. Operator. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Pangborn. Oh. Miss Pangborn? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Reader. Is anything the matter, Miss Pangborn? It's my mother. Your mother? She won't let me go. I beg your pardon? To the picture cinema. She says it's common, says it's only for the working classes. Well, I work, don't I? Good heavens, Miss Pangborn, I'm not complaining about your work. Oh, no, Mr. Reader, you never complain about anything. But if the pictures are for the working classes, well, I work. So why shouldn't I go and see Rudolph Valentino? But she won't let me. So I'm reading the book. Yes, quite well. I'm very sorry I interrupted. I, I'm most sorry. Good morning, Sir Jason. A sorry day, reader. A sorry day. Uh, the elements are somewhat inclement. I wasn't talking about the weather. Have you seen the papers? Uh, yes, Sir Jason. Well, doesn't it worry you? Indeed it does. Our recent imports in the New World are not an unmixed blessing. The moving picture, the crossword puzzle, and even the ice cream block may be described as beneficial. But I fear that insecticide is a very different matter. What about this? Whenever the word extermination crosses my mind, I can't help thinking it won't stop at insects. It's the beginning of the end, reader. Sigmund Freud, George Bernard Shaw, a Labour government... And insecticide. The old values are done for, Rita. You mark my words. Rat poison will be a thing of the past. You know what we face, don't you? Anarchy. Bolshevistic anarchy. How can I be director of public prosecutions when I have to direct public prosecutions against the whole public? I agree there's bound to be an increase. If it wasn't rat poison, the commonest methods had always been to obtain arsenic by steeping flypapers in water. But the number of flypapers it was necessary to purchase inevitably aroused suspicion. But with insecticide, anyone who cultivates a window box is a potential murderer. Reader. Uh, yes, sir, Jason? What is all this drivel about insecticides? I beg your pardon, sir, Jason. I... I see evil in everything. The fact is, I, I have a criminal mind. Well, it doesn't need a criminal mind to see evil in that. Hmm? Look what you're up to now. Oh, the Prime Minister. I take little or no interest in politics, sir, Jason. But I believe Mr. Remus Donald to be a most respectable man. Respectable? Oh, I'll tell you something the public doesn't know, reader. This leader of the Reds, this so-called socialist, owns shares. In a biscuit factory, yes, sir. Would you care to go through my analysis of the crime figures for 1923 now, sir? You knew it. Yes, sir. 
what is more, the owner of the factory was an old school friend of Mr. McDonald's at Lossiemouth, has presented him with a motor car of the latest design and a sum of money for its upkeep. Great Scott. Well, that'll go down well at the club. Thank you, reader. How do you find these things out? I had many informants, Sir Jason. Sometimes they give me information that has, in fact, no interest for me. Private information about public men and so on. I can't think why I even remember it. Since the figures now, so would you prefer to wait until Mr. Penwell has tightened? Uh, you'll notice that the number of burglaries committed by men who were officers during the late unfriendliness of the Kaiser has continued to increase. Do you ever hear anything about me? I forget, Sir Jason. You know what's wrong with you, don't you? You're broody. That's your trouble. You brood too much. Insecticides, rat poison, criminal mind, fly papers, gossip. If you say so, Sir Jason. What you need is a good woman. There's nothing wrong with you that a good woman wouldn't put right. You're broody. No doubt, Sir Jason. Uh, if you'll excuse me. Uh, Sir Jason. Uh, what? What is wrong with me? Uh, what do you mean? You said there was nothing wrong with me that a good woman couldn't put right. Uh, exactly. Well, in the absence of a good woman, I feel I should endeavour to correct these faults myself. I told you what's wrong with you. You're broody. Yes, Sir Jason. Thank you. Miss Spillman. Mr. Telfer, what is it? Get the police. You look unwell, Mr. Telfer. Shall I get a doctor? Doctor? No, not a doctor. The police. Police. It's Billingham. Billingham's gone. Well, of course, Mr. Billingham's gone, sir. A business trip to Manchester, don't you remember? But he's not in Manchester. He's gone with all the money. All of it. A hundred and fifty thousand pounds, all gone. Police, Miss Bellman, get them. Yes, Mr. Telford. The uh, police are on their way, Mr. Taylor. Never catch him. I'm ruined. Ruined. I'm sure there must be some explanation, sir. I have to sell the Wales voice. I have to resign from the club. Is there anything I can do, Mr. Telfer? Anything? You? Of course, Mr. Telfer. Well, I... I... I could sell some things before the receivers move in, and a few shares, get a, get a bit of money. I'd have to move fast. Move fast and get out of the country. I don't think you should run away, sir. That makes you look guilty. Well, what's the difference? I'm ruined anyway. Get out. Go to America. Oh, please don't do that, sir. I say, why don't you come with me? Oh, please, Miss Bellman, a chap can't face it alone. Come with me to America. Mr. Telfer. I love you. I love you. Come with me. Uh, 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 Miss Pangborn? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I just get carried away, sir. I can hardly put it down. Have you read it? No, I don't think I... Look at this bit, sir. Imagine, Rudolph Valentino, and he's just got her into his tent. Oh, listen to this. Obedient now, she forced herself to lift her eyes to his. Oh... And the shame blood surged slowly into her cheeks like a hot flame. His encircling arms were like bands of fire, scorching her. Yeah, yeah, well, th this report... His touch was torture, helpless, like a trapped wild thing she lay against him, trembling, her wide eyes fixed on him, held against her will. Oh! Dear me, it's most, most colourful now. I wonder if you'd be so kind as get this before typed by one of the young ladies in the pool. Fancy seeing a man like that. I have, on several occasions. They're all of them serving rather long sentences. Now, I wonder if you'd be so oh, good as to get... Oh, you've no romance in you, Mr. Reader. Romance? No. I suppose I have not. Do you want me to get that typed out? 
Uh, if you would be so kind. Miss mm. uh, Pangborn? Yes? If you were travelling to work unchaperoned on the Underground Railway, mm. and a middle-aged man to whom you never been introduced said good morning to you in a friendly fashion, what would you do? I'd tell him where to get off. Let us assume he knows where to get off. No. I mean, I wouldn't have anything to do with him. They're the worst, you know. The old ones. Uh, middle age. Oh, just as bad. Frida! I see. Thank you, Miss Mangold. Mr. Reader, I only meant that type of man. I mean, if it was someone like you, that would be different. How would you differentiate between the two? Well, you aren't that sort, are you? No. I suppose not. Not like some we could mention. Frida! Yes, uh, Sir Jason. Oh, there you are. Now, listen, there's been a big theft reported. A uh, chap called Billingham, managing director of Telfer's Consolidated Trust. Telfer says he's vanished with £150,000. Yeah, me, with a very large sum. Yes, biggest steal we've had in years. I thought you might be interested. I should be most happy to investigate the matter if you wish it, Sir Jason. You wish it? Who said I wished it? The city police are dealing with it. You know how touchy they are. I have had many dealings with the city police in the past, sir. And it is true that while they are perfectly amenable where such matters as murder are involved, they take a rather more serious view when money is in question. Oh, their province, isn't it? On the other hand, I have struck up various acquaintances with them while investigating certain questionable banking concerns. It was my speciality before I joined your department, sir. I know that. You think you could uh, slip in sideways on the investigation, do you? Well, any information would be useful in the event of the case being referred to this office. I believe I already have some notes on Telfer's Consolidated Trust in my private file. Listen, Mika. Don't tread on anybody's toes. If the city police start complaining to the home, Mister, I, I shall not take the responsibility. I didn't suppose you would suggest it. Uh, may I make a formal request that I can absent myself from the office, sir? Going to see your aunt, eh? A charming old lady, sir. Lives in Threadneedle Street. <laughs> Mr. Telfer is in no condition to make a statement to the press. He is in a state of collapse. I suggest you contact the city police. He has told them everything. No, you may not speak to him personally. Yes? Hello. Oh, pardon me, I... I believe I know you, young lady. Yes. We uh, live in the same district. That is so. We catch the same train every morning. The 8.47, approximately. Yes. Uh, uh, my name is Reader, uh, J.G. Reader. Uh, you, I take it, are Mr. Telfer's secretary, Miss... Yes, Margaret Bellman. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Have you come to see Mr. Telfer on business? Very much so. If you would be so kind to let him know that I'm here. I'm afraid you've come on rather a bad moment. Uh, Mr. Telfer is not quite himself. I'm not at all surprised. To be robbed of £150,000 is a melancholy circumstance. How did you know about that, Mr. Reader? Uh... Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. You? I'm so sorry. Prosecutor's department? What's the use of prosecuting him if you can't find him? 
And if you can't find him, how can you get my money back? That, if I may say so, is the object of the exercise, Mr. Telfer. Anyway, I've already told the police all I know. There may be some questions they have not thought to ask you. All right, then you better sit down. Sure. Perhaps you'd care to leave us. Yes. Until later. All right. What do you want to know? About Billingham. Did you appoint him yourself? No, my grandfather did. Your grandfather? Dear me, Billingham must have been with the firm a very long time. Not all that long. My father was always a sick man. Chronic invalid, you know. Died not long after grandfather. Uh, what year was that? 1912. Poor father. He must be turning in his grave. Why did I ever sign that check? I must have been mad. To which check do you refer, Mr. Telfer? One for £150,000, of course, the one Billingham went off and cashed. Oh, that cheque. We will come to that later. Go on with every penny I have. <laughs> Might as well have slipped my throat while he was... What do you mean, come to it later? I was thinking of certain other financial ventures recently engaged in by Telfer's Consolidated. What are you talking about? Uh, ventures which no other brokerage business will touch with a, if you'll pardon the expression, barge pole. I take it you're not married, Mr. Telfer? No. No, as a matter of fact, I'm not. How did you know? One forms impressions. You say your father was a chronic invalid. But my father has nothing whatever to do with it. But his death was not entirely unexpected. What are you getting at? That he must have left a will. How old were you at the time? Sixteen. Look, let me tell you what Billy. did. Sixteen? I can't imagine that in his will he left control of a prosperous brokerage business to a boy of such tender years. Well, in twice, my mother was executor. And your mother died when? A couple of years after my father. Look, when Billingham asked me to sign that... And did your mother leave you in sole control of the business at yes. the age of 18? Yes. Really? Well, not exactly. I'd had a nurse as a child. Presley brought me up, as a matter of fact. My mother appointed her my guardian. Uh, your guardian? For how long? Until I was 30. And what age are you now, Mr. Telfer? What difference does it make how old uh, I am? 28. Hmm? What persuaded your ex-nurse to give up control of you before the allotted time span? Did she die? No. Well, then... Damn it all, Rita. What has my personal life... What was the name of your nurse? Mrs. Welford. Welford. Married or widow? Widow. Look, for heaven's sake, Rita, what are you going to do about Why Billy? did Mrs. Welford, your ex-nurse, whom my mother appointed to be your guardian until you were 30 years of age, voluntarily relinquish control of yourself and the company several years before that date? Who says she did? Telfer's Consolidated was founded by your grandfather. Continued in an orthodox and moderately prosperous manner until two years ago. Then suddenly certain somewhat reckless adventures were embarked upon including the formation of a lost treasure company to raise a Spanish gallon that sank 300 years ago, and culminating in scenes in your signing a cheque for £150,000 with which your managing director absconded. One forms the impression that this sequence of events dates from the time when you personally took control of the company. Is that so? Well, I... Yes? Y yes, he is here. It's for you. Thank you very much. Hello? Ah, Rita. I thought I'd better keep you in touch with the latest. Uh, are you free to talk? In a moment, Sir Jason. Yes, uh, of course I will. Uh, one moment, Sir Jason. Uh, please continue, Sir Jason. Billingham turned up with Telfer's cheque at the London and Central Bank yesterday afternoon. They honoured it. And from there, he took a taxi cab to the Credit Lille Wires. He telephoned particulars in advance, and they had 11 packets waiting for him, each containing a million francs. Oh, and one smaller packet containing 182,500 francs. 11,182,000 francs. Thanks, I have to set before by five, five. Yes, that will be correct. Now, listen, Rita. Shortly after this, an acquaintance of Billingham's saw him driving through Cheapside in another taxi cab. The police have now traced this to Waterloo, just in time for yesterday evening's boat train to Paris. Mm. What? Uh, well, uh, please continue, Sir Jason. Now, listen, reader, I warned you, don't tread on the toes of the city police. I don't want any trouble with the Home Secretary, particularly a socialist Home Secretary. <laughs> Yeah, uh, carry on, Sir Jason. Don't tell him what, Mr. Telfer. I don't know anything to tell him. I, I mean, about you and me. 
There is nothing about you and me. I mean, what I said, you oh, know. Mr. Telfer, I'm hardly likely to discuss such a matter. Yes, yes, I appreciate that, Sir Jason. You're a perfectly beautiful girl, and I'm crazy about Please. you, but... Mr. Telfer... Look, look, there's a tragedy in my life. Really, a perfectly ghastly tragedy. If it hadn't been for that, I'd have spoken to you sooner. It's too late now. Everything's at sixes and sevens. Oh, if I had any sense, I'd have brought in a fella to look after things. I see that now. All the same, I'd marry you and all that, only claws in my mother's will. I would not marry you, Mr. Telfer, even if there were no claws in your mother's will. As to the suggestion that I should run away with you to America... Oh, South America, not the United States. There was never any suggestion of the United States. Please, Miss Bellman. Miss Bellman, please. Yes, Sir Jason. Uh, thank you. Uh, goodbye. I see that Telfer's consolidated a steady. And wait till the news gets out. What a wonderful invention electricity is, hmm? Do you know the heat from an electric furnace is so intense that a diamond can burn in it like a piece of coal? What's that got to do with anything? Now then, what about Billingham? What about Billingham? The picture's fairly obvious. Employed by your father and your grandfather, you trusted him implicitly. He brought you checks to sign, and you signed them without question. For a sum as large as £150,000, he no doubt made some comment about the business being in trouble and the cash was necessary to pay a dividend before the banks foreclosed. But that's what he said. Exactly what he said. Indeed. Good day, Mr Tuffer. Miss Bellman. Yes, Mr. Reader. The tickets for Paris. Were they booked through you? Paris? Is Mr. Telfer going to Paris? I don't think so. I, I was wondering about Mr. Billingham. I booked no tickets for Mr. Billingham, sir. Good, good. If I may ask, did you have any relationships with Mr. Billingham outside of office hours? You are impertinent, Mr. Reader. If I may ask. We went to the theatre on several occasions. The theatre and uh, dinner afterwards, perhaps? Yes. And he was extremely gentlemanly and courteous on all occasions. Yes, 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 of course. Uh, Mr Telfer? Yes? Bothered you a little, hasn't he? I beg your pardon? One forms impressions. I've always taken a very strong interest in office relationships. Mr Telfer is my employer. That is all. Really? Why do you persist in... It is true, Mr. Reader. Mr. Telfer did... He was in a panic, you understand. He wanted to run away. He uh, asked me to go with him. Not to France? No, uh, America. North or South? How extraordinary. What? He made a great point of it not being the United States. I was so surprised, I'm afraid I wanted to laugh. It seems so ridiculous. Not so, I'm afraid. I can't see any difference. Can't you? No. We have extradition laws with the United States. With many South American nations, we have not. You mean... Oh, no, I'm, I'm sure you're wrong, Mr. Reader. About what, Miss Bellman? Your suggestion is that Mr. Telfer himself is implicated in the theft. I did not say that. I'm beginning to realise, Mr. Reader, it is what you do not say which is important. You think, then, that Mr. Telfer is in no way implicated? Oh, quite sure. He would not have behaved as he did. Otherwise, he has always acted very properly as my employer. His wild suggestion today... I, I really feel very sorry for him. No oh, feelings to your credit, Miss Bellman. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, did he ask you to marry him? No, he was very honest about that. He said there was some clause in his mother's will. His mother's will. I wonder if you could give me the address of Mrs. Welford. Who? Mrs. Welford. His ex-nurse and later guardian. 
I have never heard of Mrs. Welford. Miss Bellman, may I presume to give you some advice? The company is bankrupt. Within a very short time, official liquidators will move in. When they do so, my opinion is that Mr. Telfer will move out and in all probability take to his bed, at least for the time being. You, however, will in all likelihood be asked to continue with your duties here, and indeed I very much hope that you are. It is kind of you to be co so concerned, Mr. Reader, but I have no anxiety about that. I think I can obtain another position. I'm sure you can. I mean, you are obviously... Yes. But in the meantime, while you continue with your work here, I, I think it likely you may receive from time to time confidential messages. If they're confidential, I will keep them so. Oh, indeed, quite so. You're clearly not a person to betray confidence, and I would not dream of asking you to do so, but what I'm thinking of is something rather different. What are you thinking of, Mr. Reader? You may receive a message from someone to go somewhere. A message from whom? To go where? If I knew that, I would have no anxiety for you. Anxiety? For me? Miss Bellman, should you receive such a message, I would be very glad if you would make certain to inform me before keeping the suggested rendezvous. Something rather important is at stake. I'm bewildered, Mr. Reader. What is at stake? I rather think... your life. Or whether it was a deliberate act of murder. Yours sincerely, etc., etc. Would you be so kind as to bring that back to me, Miss Fangborn? Sir Bernard Spilsbury, Home Office Pathologist, St. Thomas Hospital. Dear Sir Bernard, I have before me the coroner's report on one Albert Johnson of Bethnal Green, who died two weeks ago of a mysterious ailment which his general practitioner has failed to diagnose. His symptoms were. And then I copy out the report from bronchorrhea to gross pulmonary oedema. Uh, that is correct. Mm. Having considered these symptoms, I feel I must draw your attention to the recent appearance on the market of substances named insecticides. These insecticides fall into three categories. Lead arsenate, nicotine and organic phosphorus compounds. Underlying phosphorus. That is what killed him. Mm. Hello, Reader here. Good morning, Mr. Reader. Detective Sergeant Perriman here. I think I've got one right up your street, sir, if I may say so. Oh, indeed? Stealing what? Marble chippings. And off the top of a grave. Well, even you must admit, that takes a bit of beating. Thank you very much, Sergeant Perriman. That sounds very interesting. I'll be over right away. I'm sure that is all right. If we'll get it typed it out, I'll sign it later. I thought this might appeal to you. 
gravestone thief. I know you like the funny ones. You say the person you apprehended was a lady. May I ask her name? Well, she said Jackson. The address she gave was a false one. I'll bet the name is, too. She refused to tell the beak her real address. Remanded in custody for an inquiry. Mm, very interesting, most interesting. Is it permissible to ask whether when she was searched there was any document or unusual possession? Well, these were in the bag. The surface has been cut in several places. She evidently made a habit of collecting marble chipping. Anything in her in her pocketbook? Fifty five pound notes. Stamp of the central bank on their back. Should be fairly easy to trace them. Mm. Well, in the meantime, I should be grateful if you'd allow me a few words with Mrs. Jackson. Of course, if you'll follow me. I knew this one would tickle you. <laughs> <laughs> It's a long year, sir. I knew it'd tickle you. Constable, take Mr. Reader in. I'll see if we've got any news on those notes. Thank you very much. <coughs> Good morning. I should be grateful if you would give me a few minutes of your time, Mrs. Uh, Jackson. In case it is of any interest to you, I'm investigating the disappearance of the managing director of Telfer's Consolidated Trust, a Mr. Billingham. Do you happen to know where he is? Never heard of a Mr. Billingham. You seem rather surprised when I mentioned his name. Of course I was. I've never been in a police cell before. Then someone I've never seen before asked me of someone I've never heard of. And that is why you were surprised? Yes. I see. Why did you steal the marble? I admit it was a foolish thing to do. All I wanted was to make a little path for my garden, but the idea occurred to me that I was going to bed and I acted on the impulse of the moment. I could quite easily have afforded to pay for the stone. Well, as it was, well, I couldn't find a mason's yard open, so I... So you stole it from a graveyard? I make such a fuss about it. A path for your garden, I see. Uh, could you tell me the location of your garden? I will not give my address. Why not? No need to ask, Mr. Reader. I've just heard from the bank. Those notes were drawn two months ago on the account of Mr. Sidney Telfer and issued to his housekeeper. Indeed. Dear me. How do you do, Mrs. Welford? Ah, my name's Telfer, Sidney Telfer. You telephoned me. Oh, thank you for coming, sir. Now, if you'll follow me and kindly identify the lady. Oh, I had to get out of bed, you know. I'm a very sick man. As far as I can understand you, you refuse to give your correct name and address for fear of being further scandal on Mr. Sidney Telfer, whose housekeeper you are and whose nurse you used to be. Poor little boy. He, he's been so upset lately. If people would stop interfering and... Telling him to do stupid things, everything would be as it was between us, and Sidney would be happy again. Oh, who was telling him to do stupid things? Mr. Billingham? He wasn't the only one. Wasn't? You speak as though he were dead? Is he? I don't know anything about Billingham. He disappeared with all Sidney's money, that's all I know. Why did you give up your guardianship of Mr. Telfer two years ago? Guardianship? I'm still his guardian. Always have been. Always will be. Is that her, Mr. Telfer? Yes. Yes, that's her. You could have saved us all a great deal of fuss and bother if you'd said her you where to start with, Mrs. Welford. I didn't want my poor little Sidney to have any more worries. Poor oh, little Sidney? I'm not a child. Why do I have to tweet you if I were a child? Don't get upset, my darling. Everything will be all right when I come home again. Goodbye, Mrs. Welford. You'll find some nice clean socks hanging up for you in the kitchen. Can't you keep her locked up? How do you mean, sir? She's mad. Can't you see she's mad? In what way is she mad, Mr. Delta? Well, she's mad. Stealing marble from graveyards for no reason, not mad. What? You must protect me from her. If you want your old nurse certified as insane, there are certain legal procedures that you must go through. When will she be released? Well, the vicar doesn't want to press charges, and if no relations can be found, 
Now we know who she is, she'll have to come up before the magistrate again tomorrow morning and she'll be released. Tomorrow morning? Quick. <laughs> you ever seen the likes of that? A grown man. He's frightened to death of her. Oh. Uh, the magistrate sitting is Spooner, is it not? Yes, Mr. Reader. Well, I'd be grateful if you'd, if you'd given this note for me. Oh. I wanted to release Mrs. Welford, not tomorrow, but this afternoon, say at about uh, five o'clock, uh, with her marble chips. I'll ask him, sir. He's a bit crotchety, though, is Mr. Spooner. I think he would do it when he's read that. Now I must go to Somerset House. Would you be so kind as to call my office and tell them I'll be there later this afternoon? Yes, sir. Thank you. Afternoon, Miss Fanon. Good afternoon, uh, sir. Oh, dear me, are you upset again? I don't care if the pictures are common. I'm going to see him. May I ask if there have been any messages for me? No. No, no messages. Ah, oh, Rita. I shall be at the club if anyone wants me, Miss Pangwall. Yes, Sir Jason. Uh, Rita, about the Billingham case. I've uh, just had something very interesting from Scotland Yard. Did you know that Telfer has a secretary and that she and Billingham were very close friends? Very close friends? Really? They are to place her under general supervision, but uh, in cases like Billingham's, it's often a matter of cherche la femme. Cherche la femme? Dear me. Thank you. Uh, Rita, yeah? Oh, uh, good afternoon, Miss Bellman. You said when you were here, you said I might be asked to go somewhere to meet someone. Well, I have been. Oh, indeed? It all seems perfectly innocent, but, well, I thought I'd better let you know. I have had a note by messenger from Mr. Telfer. He asks if I could go to see him. At what time, Miss Bellman? Seven o'clock this evening. I see. And suppose I were to forbid you to meet this re request? You are in no position to forbid me to do anything, Mr. Reader. I shall keep the appointment. Um. Uh. Well, in that case, it's about uh, five o'clock. You have two hours to spare. May I suggest you remain at your office? I think it's likely you may receive a second message. A second message from whom, Mr. Reader? Mr. Reader? Mr. Reader, Mr. Reader, a police car is here for you. Thank you, Miss Pangborn. Oh, it's waiting. It's waiting. Thank you, Miss Pangborn. Hello, Mr. Telfer's office. Who? Mrs. Welford. Yes. Yes, of course I will.
Good evening. You are rather early, if I may say so. Oh, Mr. Reader, you frightened me. I do beg your pardon. And I'd be obliged if you could keep your voice down. Is there anything wrong? Did you receive another message? One that brought you here early? Uh, yes, from a Mrs. Welford. I think you asked me about her, didn't you? Did I? Yes, I believe I did. It seems uh, she's Mr. Telfer's housekeeper. Indeed, housekeeper. Well, well. And what did Mrs. Welford want of you? To make sure that Mr. Telfer had asked me to bring the note he sent me, since she didn't think his private correspondence should be left lying around. And she wanted you to come earlier? Oh, yes, immediately. She's alone in the house with him, and Mr. Telfer refuses to have a trained nurse near him. He's very ill, apparently. Well, I will ring the bell for you. Uh, that isn't necessary. Mrs. Welford said she'd leave the door on the latch. She didn't want Mr. Telford disturbed by the noise of the bell. Uh, of course. But then I suggest you go in and I follow you. I'm not sure if you may go in, Mr. Weaver. Do as I tell you, please. Now, quietly. You brought Sydney's letter with you? Yes, Mrs. Welford. Good. Will you please telephone the doctor and tell him Mr. Telford's had a relapse? The number is Circle 743. You'll find the telephone under the stairs. coming from that pipe. Jug, or I will blow your features into comparative chaos. Oh, please, put down that jug. Mrs. Telfer? How did you find out? I spent the morning at Somerset House. It was quite easy to find your marriage certificate of two years ago now. Please, put that down. No! No! You don't understand. My little boy wanted to run off with her, that hussy. After all I've done for him, I've nursed him since he was four, you know. It's all that Billingham's fault. Him and that girl who were leading my boy astray. The money's all here. I'm keeping it for Sydney for when he's better. I sympathise with you deeply, but as far as the young lady downstairs is concerned, I assure you were entirely mistaken. No, no, she was after him. When I took him by surprise, coming home this afternoon, he was packing. I knew where he was going, so I had to get her first. Whatever your husband's intentions, I can assure you there was never the slightest possibility of her going off with him. I know that for a fact. How do you know that? What do you know about her? She... She happens to be my wife. Your wife? Ah! Now, walk downstairs as quickly as you can and open that telephone booth. You ran a pipe down from the room into the telephone booth. If there are law against that. What was the purpose of the pipe, Mrs. Telfer? What was the purpose of the pipe? During my investigations, I gleaned some information about your first husband. 
He was a professor of chemistry and he also died of carbon dioxide poisoning. I said also, Mr. Telfer. Well, if you know that... I know everything. But it would be better if you told the police in your own words. Oh, it's quite painless. As that gentleman says, that's what my first husband died of. Some said it was an accident, some said... Why should he kill himself? Why? You know, it's a funny thing, but... Now that I think of him, I can't remember his face. I can't remember his face. But I never forgot about the gas. That's how I knew about the marble chips. Tell me about the marble chips. That's how you make carbon dioxide. Steeping marble chips in hydrochloric acid. It's heavier than air, so you can pour it out like water from a jug. That's what I did when I tricked Mr. Billingham into the telephone booth. I only did it for Sydney. He's all I have in the world. Who's going to wash his socks now? Tell me about Billingham. Poor Billingham. I see his point. He saw how the business has been ruined by Telfer ever since he had control of it and decided to salvage what he could for himself. I know all that, but where's his body? The house is all electric. I fear that Sir Bernard Spilsbury will be able to make very little of what remains. Will you excuse me, Sir Jason? No. No, indeed, I... I hope you realise how lucky you were. Lucky, Sir Jason? Had it not turned out that there was a murder in this case, the city police might have been very annoyed with you. Very annoyed indeed. How often must I ask you to stick to your brief and suppress this tendency of yours to behave like a one-man detective force? I do apologise, Sir Jason. I shall endeavour to do as you say. But unfortunately, I have an extraordinary turn of mind, and when I heard that Mr. Telfer had buried his old nurse, I couldn't help seeing certain implications. Yes, I must say that was most extraordinary. Even to gain control of his own money, incredible that he should actually marry her. Perhaps there's more to it than that, Sir Jason. More? What more? Perhaps Mr. Telfer thought there was nothing wrong with him that the love of a good woman couldn't put right. What have you to thank me for, Miss Bill? The uh, little matter of saving my life. On the contrary, I'm, a, I'm afraid I risked it rather unnecessarily. But there is something else, something rather more serious. It's been disturbing me a good deal. What is that, Mr. Hill? It was essential to take Mrs. Telfer off our guard for a moment. <coughs> and in order to do that, I'm sorry to say, well, I'm afraid I... I... What did you do, Mr. Lee? I told her you were my wife. I could think of nothing else. Oh, I do apologize most sincerely. <laughs> 